So when DSTV came into the scene, it really took us by storm. I was never used to seeing so many channels on the television. Every time we would find the usual 70 land, Takalani, Sesame and the cool cats every single morning. generations at nights or on a very very lucky day i would get home early from school and tune into sapc 2 at around 5 pm and find the one and only dragon ball z playing oh those were the good times i won't lie That was actually the peak of SAPC and ETV. But hear me out though, when DSTV came around, things really ascended and reached for the stratosphere. DSTV was absolutely iconic. They have messed up the viewing experience so badly in recent years that we forget just how iconic this company actually was and how many childhood and teenage memories they actually gave to most of you watching this video right now. For example, let's take a short trip into my childhood. Phineas and Ferb, Fat Dog Mendoza, Ed, Ed and Eddie, Ben 10, Moving on to my teen years, there was Zeke and Luther, Sweet Life of Zeke and Cody, and of course, Pair of Kings. We can't forget that one. I'll never forget the memories DSTV gave us. The early 2000s and late 90s generations understand just how good DSTV actually was. This was the peak of viewing pleasure and it's what exactly helped DSTV end the reign of the SAPC monopoly in the television industry. The memories I just expressed to you guys are exactly why DSTV and multi-choice as a whole managed to establish a chokehold over the entire industry in a of just a few years. The fall of DSTV is so hard because DSTV had the best rise and the highest peak. SAPC didn't touch the heights of entertainment that DSTV gave us. So where the mess started to happen is when DSTV began to repeat content way too much. They were just overdoing it honestly. To a point where we would be flipping through channels looking for just anything and I mean literally anything we would actually watch that wouldn't be repeating. Heck, at one point I would have even watched Keeping Up With The Kardashians. But you know DSTV would have still repeated episodes of that thing as well and that would have literally bored me to oblivion. From there, DSTV made another big mistake. The big name shows, those entertaining shows left the platform and we started seeing a lot of cheaper and boring content coming along. It's like the time SAPC2 stopped playing Dragon Ball Z and Naruto and then started playing a lot of boring nonsense. In today's day and age, DSTV has dumbed down all the channels to suit the viewing pleasure of a person that has lived under a rock for years or the viewing pleasure of a seven year old. And even my seven year old nephew complained about repeated episodes and chose to play with the phone instead. Going down this rabbit hole of trying to find out why DSTV is allegedly in free fall and why they love repeating shows and movies led me to the most powerful company that no one seems to be talking about. It's like the company didn't even exist until I started looking around for answers. This company owns multi-choice, take a lot, even the huge media company News24 belongs to them. If you haven't guessed who the chairman of this company is, it's the one and only Kurs Becker. Yes, Kurs Becker who appears on my video about the super rich individuals who control the country. That Coerspecker. So, what led me to this company called Nespers? It was a Tuesday morning. I was still conflicted on which topic to choose from the community post, asking you guys to list some interesting ideas that I can do in the future. So, I got intrigued by a comment saying I must check out DSTV because one thing has always annoyed me about this company DSTV loves to repeat shows and movies. Love with a capital letter L. Repeating shows and movies can have one key explanation from my personal standpoint wanting to make as much money as possible, buying the licenses to air these movies movies and TV shows on stations can be very expensive, especially if you're a big company like Nespers or another famous case like Netflix few years ago. But to also remain unbiased, another reason for repetitions is to allow people to catch up on previous episodes they may have missed. As DSTV says, we want you to get the chance to record the episode. The moment Netflix started having massive global dominance in the streaming industry, Disney, HBO and other production gatekeepers became very salty. Why would Disney become salty you ask? Well, companies like Disney have been the global powerhouse in the entertainment industry because of their selling power at cinemas. Of course, Disney has the branding power as well, such as the Mickey Mouse brand and Disneyland and Disney World. Right? But the power of Disney Corporation went into the stratosphere when the Marvel movies started selling like golf slows and knickknacks. There are six Disney movies in the top 10 best selling movies of all time. I don't think you guys understand just how big of a deal that actually is. The Avengers movie made $1.5 billion at the box office. A Disney movie, Spider-Man No Way Home $1.9 billion. 
Disney movie. Avengers Infinity Wars, $2.04 billion. Disney movie. Star Wars The Force Awakens, $2.06 billion. Disney movie. Avengers Endgame, $2.79 billion. Disney, Disney, Disney. Oh, and of course, more Disney. In 2022, the Walt Disney Company had a revenue of $82.7 billion. Well, this is all because of the popularity of the Disney Company skyrocketing when the Marvel franchise took over the film industry. They finally made it out of the Mickey Mouse theme park with these movies on it. But anyway, my whole point here is, when Netflix started blowing up, they were putting Disney and other traditional movie companies at risk. Look at how streaming completely destroyed the music industry. Companies that heavily relied on physical copies were completely annihilated. Spotify destroyed these companies, but smart companies like Universal Music Group, Sony Entertainment, Warner Music Group all negotiated their way into a stake of Spotify and the large share of the money made from music stream. How did they do it? They own the music. They own the musicians. If Universal and Sony remove their catalogs, it would completely destroy Spotify as a company because there wouldn't be any of our favorite artists and songs found on Spotify. Who would still use Spotify honestly if that happened? So Spotify was allowed to have the power it has right now. Now, its power is merely an illusion to a certain point. This is why Spotify loves podcasts so much. They are not at risk when it comes to a podcast, and hence why they pay such a large sum of money when it comes to making deals with people like Joe Rogan, because they bring a massive, massive audience to the platform of Spotify, and they don't have to share a card with major record labels. One thing about Netflix is they are the most stubborn company you will ever come across. When Disney, HBO and other big traditional cinema and television companies all withdrew their material from Netflix because of course Netflix was refusing to pay the massive demands these companies wanted. Netflix found a better solution. Netflix bought the rights to House of Cards. House of Cards is actually what opened the floodgates for Netflix because the massive success of this iconic show led to Netflix buying rights to a lot of shows that were being dumped by companies that didn't listen to what the people wanted or what the people loved. Netflix was seen as a savior. The original content by Netflix became household names like HBO's Game of Thrones and all those other Disney movies as well. The next thing Netflix did in this battle against traditional distribution is they started creating their own original shows and movies or should I say they became a production company by funding creators. This really exploded and took everyone by storm, thus leading to Netflix fully integrating streaming as the new form of distribution of films and TV shows without compromising ownership of their company. The lesson from this Netflix story is, through extreme difficulty, Netflix didn't allow themselves to get strong-armed and bullied by a monopoly company into paying unbelievable amounts. They created something new and put on a fight and to this day, no movie streaming platform even holds a candle to Netflix despite how boring it has actually become. And by no movie streaming or what, what platform, I actually mean that everybody thinks about Netflix when it comes to movie streaming or TV show stream. That's the first company that comes to mind. In the case of multi-choice and DSTV, DSTV shouldn't be your focus. You are not looking in the right place. Now open your ears a little wide. Multi-choice owns DSTV. Nespas owns multi-choice. Nespas owns Showmax. Nespas owns Media24 or News24. Africa's largest publisher, printer, and distributor of magazines and related products. Basically, that's fancy language of saying they own the flipping media in Africa. Nespers owns Take A Lot, the largest online retailer in South Africa. And then, the biggest one of them all, Nespers owns 28% of Tencent. Bro, do you know what Tencent actually is? Tencent at one point had a bigger revenue than Disney. We're talking about a company at one point that was bigger than Disney and is currently as big as Disney itself. These guys own 28% of this company at this moment, if I'm not mistaken. There is no competition for Nespers and no one can even challenge them. Look at how Netflix struggled against Disney. Now imagine having to challenge Nespers here in Africa. They will bury you alive. DSTV will do whatever the hell they want. Heck, DSTV will play a movie from 2002 and you won't do a damn thing about it because they won't be out here paying a massive fortune to Disney just to get their hands on a movie the same year it comes out. Why would they do that? This is a game of either maintaining revenue or only making moves that improve a company's revenue. This is a mindset of you are lucky we are even giving you Cartoon Network. You are lucky we even give you Disney. So now, watch these shows on repeat and stop complaining. That's basically what they are saying to us with their actions. According to a News24 article, the reasoning behind the unbearable constant repetition of the same movies on DSTV is so you can get the chance to watch a movie you actually missed. So now we must actually watch the same movie 20 times in a single year, basically. That's what they are telling us. Because you don't want to reinvest capital in, into other movies that are popping during the period of time we are actually in right now. 
now. Oh, by the way, I believe you've all caught on to the fact that Nespers owns News24 as I say. So this article is a little unreliable in the fact that I strongly believe the reason given to us isn't the full picture. Nespers has a deeper hand than that. They also own City Press, Daily Sun, Sokala Duma, Business Insider. So do you still wonder why Kors Becker is such a saint according to traditional media? Why you never ever heard about this company in the public eye? The web of influence and control goes so deep. I got caught deeply in this rabbit hole that I had to gather my thoughts and make sure that I don't go too far off topic. This was meant to be a deep dive into DSTV but it led me to some information that really shocks me. I never knew South Africa or even Africa as a whole has one of the largest media companies in the entire world. Like seriously, if these guys theoretically wanted to crush the economy of a country, they can spread some news very quickly and instantly sell off the rent and push prices down. But hey, I'm not saying these innocent good student bosch businessmen are doing things like that. Another reason why DSTV or multi-choice is moving slowly besides the lack of competition is Nespa's ownership of Showmax. Showmax already seems like the second most popular TV show and movie streaming platform in South Africa behind Netflix. If it's not the most popular, it seems the emphasis is heavily on the parent company. The parent company knows they have a massive chunk of the streaming industry here in South Africa amongst all the local companies. So they don't need to worry about some random company popping up like what Netflix did to Disney. Well, except for the fact that Disney is becoming extremely popular. Well, except for the fact that Netflix is becoming extremely popular here in South Africa as well and is posing a threat for Nespers. The way I first viewed this entire matter was totally wrong. This is not about DSTV or multi-choice allegedly creating a monopoly. This is more about Nespers allegedly having an established media monopoly in South Africa for nearly 100 years now. Yes, 100 years with two zeros. Shocking, right? Let's take you all back in time and tell you about Nespers in detail. It might be a little boring, but it will be very important details later on in this video. In 1914, a group of prominent Cape Town Afrikaners decided at a meeting in Stellenbosch to form a publishing company that would support the Afrikaner nationalism in the Union of South Africa. Basically, this early version of the company is low-key part of the founding fathers of what Malema calls the Stellenbosch Mafia or what the author of the book actually calls Stellenbosch Mafia. There's the name Mafia on that but doesn't really mean to say that they are actually doing some Mafia activity or something like that. All that is just alleged information based on the book of the same name. This meeting led to the creation of the National Press in 1915 as a publisher of the newspaper and magazines in Stellenbosch. The firm's name was commonly shortened to Nespers, but it's actually called the, Nas the National Pers Bepec. The full name is just complex, so even the company itself ended up sticking to mostly using the shortened version. Nespers launched with the support of Jenny Marai, a prominent Stellenbosch farmer, Jan Christian Smuts, Louis Porter, and the National Party founding father, J.B.M. Herzog. Nespers was allegedly strongly supportive of the National Party and became publishing the Afrikaans language daily debate Berger, later renamed Die Berger in June 1915, followed by its first magazine, Die Heis Genot, which later rebranded to Die Heis Genot in 1916. In 1970, Nespers bought the weekly Bloemfontein-based Afrikaans newspaper, Het Volksblad. This was the first expansion beyond the Cape province of the company. In 1925, Die Volksblad started publishing daily, and few years later, things really got interesting when in 1937, National Pairs set up the company Vortrekkers Pairs in the transfer to support the National Party in Transvaal by publishing the Transvaal. In the beginning, the Cape National Party tried to control the extremism of the National Party in the Transvaal by appointing Henrik Vervoort as the paper's first editor, but he would eventually side with the Transvaal branch and this led to the National Press giving up editorial control in 1939. I know some of you, much like me, before reading on this matter, don't know who Henrik Vervoort actually is. Vervoort was a South African politician that is commonly regarded as the founding father of apartheid. I've heard Julius Malema reference him dozens of times, right? When speaking about apartheid, it seems Fervoort played a significant role in socially engineering the whole thing. Basically, in socially engineering this, the country's system of racial segregation and the whole white supremacy thing and implementing policies as the Minister of Native Affairs and then also as a Prime Minister. Fervoort is said to have played a vital role in helping the far-right National Party come into power in 1948, serving as the political strategist and a propaganda machine. He was the Union of South Africa's last Prime Minister because he proclaimed the founding of the Republic 
Republic of South Africa and remained as the country's prime minister until his assassination in 1966. This is basically the man who spearheaded a lot of things that have anything to do with racial segregation in South Africa. The architect, and do you remember what I said earlier? He was the first editor in charge of the transfer. Control the media, control the narrative, control the people, and thus your power will be born. The question then goes, why didn't the early version of NASPAS try to put a stop to Fervour and anyone else at the time that was on this racial segregation thing? It's so clear and easy for me to assume that to assume that this man's gateway to power is through control of the media, but that is just my opinion. Look at another example of a clear political war being waged using the media. CNN and MSNBC versus Fox News. Republican policies are heavily favored by Fox News and Sky Australia. Hence why you see them leaning heavily towards Donald Trump. And then CNN and MSNBC which heavily leans towards the Democrats in the United States and are heavily against Donald Trump. Hence why they will look to clean up after President Joe Biden and heavily support Obama. So I'm sure you guys now are starting to have the veil removed that is covering your eyes. From all the research so far, it seems so clear that Nespas was clearly a media company. Or should I say, I can now see why they are classified as a media company. When you look at Nespas right now, this is not a mere media titan. This company has a massive web. So the question on my mind now is, who did this massive, unbelievable wealth and diversity start to happen in this company? Tencent is the world's largest video game vendor and you might actually know Tencent because of Super Mario Bros. And the company is one of the most valuable companies in the world. In 2021, the value of Tencent nearly reached $1 trillion. Do you now get the picture of how big this company actually is? When we talk trillion, we are talking companies like Alphabet, Apple, Amazon. This is the company that Nespas has a share in, a very massive share in that regard. They are bread and butter from my own observation. Nespas investment in Tencent is viewed as one of the top five most successful ventures venture capital deals of all time. A venture capital, from my own knowledge, is basically a company that invests in startup companies in exchange for a percentage of the company's shares or equity. Let's look at Google's definition of what a venture capital is. A venture capital is a form of private equity financing that is provided by venture capitals or companies to fund startups, early stage and emerging companies that have been deemed to have high growth potential or which have demonstrated high growth. Now get this, Nespas was the most valuable publicly traded company in Africa as of 2017. I still view them as the most valuable and most powerful company in Africa by a mile. In 2003, Nespas took full ownership of Mnet and its sister companies MultiChoice and Mweb, integrating their extensive operations across Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. With the success of their investment in Tencent, Nespas became an investor in a number of consumer internet startups. In January 2007, Nespas purchased a 30% share of Russia's largest internet company VK, or formerly known as Mail.ru. I found out that the region where Nespas invested the heaviest is actually India, which makes a lot of sense to me when I judge from an unbiased view. The population of India is unbelievable. That's a very massive market. Nespas is said to have invested around $4 billion in the Indian region over a period of about six years. In 2018, Nespas outright invested $1 billion into a company called Swiggy. Now hold on, before you call this move ludicrous, because in my opinion, this was actually a genius move. You see, this company called Swiggy is a food ordering service in India. Remember, we are talking about a population of more than 1 billion people. And everyone, I mean literally everyone, needs food, but also everyone loves food. If you have control of the food industry, in an area with a large population, then you will be untouchable. This is the same thing that Nespas seems to have noticed as well, and they dutifully capitalized on this. Where Take A Lot comes into the picture is in 2015 when Nespas acquired 46% in the newly merged company after the merger between Take A Lot and Kalahari.com took place. By the time 2018 came around, Nespas owned 96% of Take A Lot, the largest online retailer in South Africa, basically the Amazon of South Africa. The scary thing about Nespas is the dollar value of their share in Tencent. Their share in Tencent at the time of purchase was just a $32 million investment, but by 2018, their stake was worth $175 billion. That is unbelievable scary for a company to own that much. For an investor to own that much of a company, all Nespers had to do was sell a little bit of those shares and they instantly had $10 billion to reinvest in other companies and startups. I've gone through so much information regarding this one company, but the scary part is this isn't even the air. The part where the alleged DSTV monopoly comes in in is quite a funny yet obvious thing. In 2019, Nespers created a spin-off of their multi-choice and Showmax company. The new company
company was named multi-choice club when showmax arrived it was dubbed as the savior the savior coming to save us from dstv here is new regularly updated local content you have to pay for a tiny subscription and you can escape the dark stranglehold of dstv this is like a situation where you are dating a girl only to later realize you have been dating two identical twins all along why do i say this because as i said before nespas owns both dstv and showmax and they've been integrated into one company like the multi-choice group they listed in 2019 holds both these entities so they are making money hitting both birds with one stone and they don't have to spend a lot of money paying for licenses to air recently released movies and tv shows on dstv why would they spend all that money on the same effort on both showmax and dstv you just have to pay a lot more money and you can have showmax on your dstv that's basically what they tell us so so who is the man at the helm of this ship let's talk about course becker the chairman of nespers the way course becker came to power in this powerhouse is because he and a few young colleagues created mnet and his sister company on top of this in the 1990s he was the founding director of mtn you all know just how big mtn is right now in 1997 becker became ceo of nespers who of course initially invested in mnet when becker and friends created it the market capitalization of nespers grew from about 1 billion dollars to 45 billion dollars during his time as the ceo what really makes becker so rich is one very big decision he made throughout his career instead of the usual compensation or an outright salary course becker chose to receive compensation via stock option and as a result right now he's one of the dollar billionaires here in south africa so a key lesson i learned from this entire entire shocking situation so a key lesson i learned invest in company stocks or invest in companies with signs of emergence in the future that's it for today's video and i hope you guys have really enjoyed it and thank you for 20,000 subscribers stay tuned for the next video and shout out to the first channel member you are really appreciated